what Hitler meant by Lebensraum in his own words. In this video, you will hear the words and sentences of Adolf Hitler directly as a first-hand source. His words and sentences are from his own books and translated. Yes, you heard that right. Hitler wrote two books, Mein Kampf, which is my struggle, and the Zweites Buch, the second book. Lebensraum literally means living space. As you might have guessed, Hitler did not believe that the Germans had enough living space. The topic will be divided into two videos. First, in this video, I will show you why and how Hitler thought that the lack of living space was a problem. Secondly, in the next video, I will show you what Hitler thought the solution should be to the lack of living space. I will begin this first video with a background to get you introduced to the time and situation after World War I. The place is Germany and the era is the 20 year interwar period that lasted from the end of the First World War in 1918 and the start of the Second World War in 1938. In World War I, two million German men had died and several million had been severely wounded, but were alive in Germany. One of them being Hitler. For four years, from the ages 25 to 29, he had served Germany in World War I. Ten years later, in 1928, Hitler had finally written both of his two books. By that time, he was 39 years old, born 1889. He had then already been working for the National Socialists for nine years and held several large speeches in Bavaria, Munich. In 1928, NSDAP got 800,000 votes. With regards to Lebensraum, it's important to understand that by the 1920s, all of the leading nations of Europe were very industrialized. Ever since its unification in 1871, Germany had composed a great threat in industry towards the dominant power in Europe at that time, namely the British Empire. It really can't be emphasized enough that during these decades, the industrial nations were extremely dependent on natural resources above anything else. And the way to acquire these natural resources such as coal, food, oil, copper, iron and timber was either through a territorial policy like that of the British Empire or the French Empire or through vast mainland holdings such as the United States or Russia had. After World War I, Germany had none of the two. Because in accordance with the Versailles Treaty, the few colonies that Germany had in Asia and Africa were now taken by the British Empire and the French Empire. Not only were the colonies taken, but also large parts of mainland Germany were taken and given to surrounding countries such as Poland, France and Belgium. France received Alsace and Lorraine, and Poland received West Prussia. Also, besides territorial losses, because of Germany's very weak military and financial situation, Germany was not able to even control the remaining German territories. The military was almost non-existent because the Treaty of Versailles had limited Germany to an army of 100,000 men as compared to 800,000 in 1914. And the financial situation was catastrophic because of the reparations Germany was required to pay to both the British and the French empires. The total amount was set at 226 billion gold marks which is equivalent to roughly one trillion dollars in today's value. Although it should be said that this amount was later reduced by about 40% because of Germany's inability to pay. Part of the payments were to be paid in raw materials, but in consequence of Germany not being able to pay in time, the French and Belgian troops occupied the German rural area where the coal production was. Even the British did not agree to this, and the occupation worsened Germany's economy leading to the hyperinflation of 1923. Lastly, without the consent of the League of Nations, Germany was forbidden to unite with Austria. Hitler, along with many other Germans, were extremely frustrated at the Treaty of Versailles as well as the ruling Weimar Republic, because through them Germany had lost not only its independence, but also all its hope for a positive future. The end of that background takes us to part one, the problem why and how Hitler thought that the lack of living space was a problem.
Hitler saw himself as a German, or more correctly, as part of the German people. He was part of the German group, and the German group was part of him. So needless to say, he was a collectivist. This is what he wrote. I am a German nationalist. This means that I proclaim my nationality. My whole thought and action belongs to it. I am a socialist. I see no class and no socialist state before me, but that community of the folk made up of people who are linked by blood, united by a language, and subject to a same general fate. I love this folk and hate only its majority of the moment, because I view the latter to be just as little representative of the greatness of my folk as it is of its happiness. Hitler wanted the best for this group. He saw the nation and all of the generations in it as one big family that should hold each other to the highest standards. So he was highly dissatisfied and frustrated with the state of Germany compared to other states, not only after the First World War, but throughout his whole life. He wanted the citizens of one and the same race to become as united and strong as possible, and to always remember the sacrifices of the past generations as well as the future generations of the nation. We have to remember that Hitler grew up in the Austro-Hungary Empire, which was very multicultural and very divided. So this lack of loyalty really bothered him. So needless to say, he wanted to unite the German folk within one great country. He saw that German culture and people only needed the right prerequisites to succeed. And then Hitler lays out these prerequisites in the National Socialist 25 point program. One of the main lacking prerequisites that was holding Germany back was in Hitler's view point number three on that list, a lack of territory. We demand land and territory for the sustenance of our people and colonization for our surplus population. He goes on inside this book. Indeed, we can justly say that the whole life struggle of a folk, in truth, consists in safeguarding the territory it requires as a general prerequisite for the sustenance of the increasing population. Since its historical entry into world history, the German folk has always found itself in need of space. Indeed, its first political emergence was forced primarily by that need. Since the beginning of the migration of folks, our folk has never been able to settle this need for space, except through conquest by the sword or through a reduction of its own population. Thus, the problem of the sustenance of the German folk had not been solved for the existing human mass, not even by the foundation of the new Reich. A further increase of the German nation, however, could not take place without such a solution. Regardless of how such a solution might turn out, it had to be found in any case. Hence the most important problem of German foreign policy after 1870-1871 had to be the question of solving the problem of sustenance. Okay, so Germany was not large enough according to Hitler. Large enough for what though? Well, the one word answer is food. At least food is the main thing he focuses on in his books. By not having enough territory, that also meant not having enough food. But the next question is, not enough food for what exactly? And the answer is, not enough food to be able to grow the German population. And this bothered Hitler extremely much, because what it meant was that the German people were stuck in their situation. The German folks' prospects are hopeless neither the present living space nor that achieved by a restoration of the borders of 1914 will allow us to lead a life analogous to that of the American folk. Meanwhile, the other powerful nations at this time, like the US and Russia, had vast mainland territories, and the French and British colonial empires, well, they had their colonies to cover for their natural resources and food needs. Germany had lost their colonies after the First World War, and as he says, In the 19th century, such colonial territories were no longer obtainable by peaceful means. Germany has an annual increase in population of nearly 900,000 souls. The difficulty of feeding this army of new citizens must grow greater from year to year and ultimately end in catastrophe, unless ways and means are found to forestall the danger of starvation and misery in time. So while the 65 million Germans in 1925 were not exactly starving, they also did not have enough agriculture to be able to feed a growing population, in Hitler's estimation. But why couldn't Germany simply increase their food production? A valid logical argument worthy of a closer look. 
Unfortunately, Hitler addresses it extensively in his books. The short answer is, they could, to a limit. Hitler saw two ways of increasing German food production. The first, he writes, is increasing the productivity of the soil. That is, to make the existing German farms more productive. The second way to increase food production that he mentions is to find new previously unused land inside Germany and turn that into farmland. This is what he calls internal colonization. Regarding the first way, increasing productivity of the soil, Hitler admits that Germany could make some improvements on the productivity of the soil and agriculture and produce food for perhaps a few extra million in population. He says, Without doubt, the productivity of the soil can be increased up to a certain limit, but only up to a certain limit, and not continuously without end. For a certain time, it will be possible to compensate for the increase of the German people without having to think of hunger by increasing the productivity of our soil. But even then, his conclusion is, as you heard, that at some point the peak would be reached of the carrying capacity of the German territory, despite these improvements the carrying capacity of the environment being the maximum population size of a biological species that can be sustained by a specific environment. Here is how he says it. The idea of increasing the yield of the soil within borders that have been fixed once and forever is an old one. The history of human cultivation of the soil is one of permanent progress, permanent improvement, and therefore of increasing yields. While the first part of this progress lay in the field of methods of soil cultivation as well as in the construction of settlements, the second part lies in increasing the value of the soil artificially through the introduction of nutritious matter that is lacking or insufficient. This line leads from the hoe of former times up to the modern steam plow, from stable manure up to present artificial fertilizers. Without doubt, the productivity of the soil has thereby been infinitely increased, but it is just as certain that there is a limit somewhere. He goes on to say that the same argument he had against increasing the productivity of the soil also works against internal colonization. Regardless of how Italy, or let's say Germany, carry out the internal colonization of their soil, regardless of how they increase the productivity of their soil further through scientific and methodical activity, there always remains the disproportion of the number of their population to the soil. The effects that it is hoped to achieve through internal colonization, in particular, rest on a fallacy. The opinion that we can bring about a considerable increase in the productivity of the soil is false. Regardless of how, for example, the land is distributed in Germany, whether in large or in small peasant holdings, or in plots for small settlers, this does not alter the fact that there are, on the average, 136 people to one square kilometer. This is an unhealthy relation. By increasing the productivity of the soil, however, some alleviation of a folk's lot could be achieved. But in the long run, this would never exempt it from the duty to adapt the nation's living space, become insufficient to the increased population. It is impossible to feed our folk on this basis and under this premise. Hitler also makes it clear that he dislikes to bring attention to this idea in the first place because he does not see a complete solution to the problem in it. He only views increasing productivity of the soil as something that would mitigate or reduce the problem slightly, but not solve it. Indeed, it would only create confusion to set the slogan of internal colonization before the masses, who will then latch their hopes onto it and thereby think to have found a means of doing away with their present distress. This would not at all be the case. It will often be harmful for a nation's foreign policy position because it awakens hopes which can remove a folk from realistic thinking. The ordinary, respectable citizen will then really believe that he can find his daily bread at home through industry and hard work rather than realize that the strength of a folk must be concentrated in order to win new living space. For us Germans, the slogan of inner colonization is catastrophic if for no other reason, because it automatically reinforces us in the opinion that we have found a means which, in accordance with the pacifistic tendency, allows us to earn our right to exist by labor in a life of sweet slumbers. Once this doctrine were taken seriously in our country, it would mean the end of every exertion to preserve for ourselves the place which is our due. Once the average German became convinced that he could secure his life and future in this way, 
All attempts at an active and hence alone fertile defense of German vital necessities would be doomed to failure. In the face of such an attitude on the part of the nation, any really beneficial foreign policy could be regarded as buried, and with it, the future of the German people as a whole. So despite being able to make improvements in productivity, Hitler's opinion was that Germany's internal and domestic food situation was doomed sooner or later. That is, at least as long as Germany wanted to be self-sustainable in their food. But what if Germany would not have to be self-sustainable on their food production? And here it gets interesting, because several new possibilities are discussed in his books. One option he discusses is to buy food from other countries to be able to grow Germany's population. But with what means? By producing and selling more from German industry. Here is what Hitler has to say about that idea. Economics, which especially today is regarded by many as the savior from distress and care, hunger and misery, can under certain preconditions give a folk possibilities for existence which lie outside its relation to its own soil. But this is linked to a number of prerequisites. It would involve the increase of commodity production and the conversion of the domestic economy into an export economy. We could produce for foreign needs through industry and commerce and defray the cost of living from the proceeds. The sense of such an economic system lies in the fact that a nation produces more of certain vital commodities than it requires for its own use. It sells this surplus outside its own national community. And with the proceeds therefrom, it procures those foodstuffs and also the raw materials which it lacks. Thus, this kind of economics involves not only a question of production, but in at least as great a degree, a question of selling. There is much talk, especially at the present time, about increasing production. But it is completely forgotten that such an increase is of value only as long as a buyer is at hand. So essentially he's saying, yes, it is possible that Germany produces more and that they sell in order to be able to buy more food. But he also says that everything depends on if there are enough buyers. He continues. In practice, however, this in no way changes the fact of the inadequate sustenance of a nation as a result of insufficient soil. For to be sure, we can increase certain industrial outputs, indeed many times over, but not the production of foodstuffs. Once a nation suffers from this need, an adjustment can take place only if a part of its industrial overproduction can be exported in order to compensate from the outside for the foodstuffs that are not available in the homeland. But an increase in production having this aim achieves the desired success only when it finds a buyer, and indeed a buyer outside the country. Thus we stand before the question of the sales potential, that is, the market, a question of towering importance. Hitler goes on to explain that the buyers are limited and that many industrial countries will be competing harshly for these few buyers. The present world commodity market is not unlimited. The number of industrially active nations has steadily increased. Almost all European nations suffer from an inadequate and unsatisfactory relation between soil and population. Hence they are dependent on world export. In recent years, the American Union has turned to export, as has also Japan in the East. Thus, a struggle automatically begins for the limited markets, which becomes tougher the more numerous the industrial nations become, and conversely, the more the markets shrink. The more market difficulties increase, the more bitterly will the struggle for the remaining ones be waged. Although the primary weapons of this struggle lie in pricing, and in the quality of the goods with which nations competitively try to undersell each other, in the end, the ultimate weapons even here lie in the sword. The so-called peaceful economic conquest of the world could take place only if the earth consisted of purely agrarian nations and but one industrially active and commercial nation. Since all great nations today are industrial nations, the so-called peaceful economic conquest of the world is nothing but the struggle with means which will remain peaceful for as long as the stronger nations believe they can triumph with them. That is, in reality, for as long as they are able to kill the others with peaceful economics. For this is the real result of the victory of a nation with peaceful economic means over another nation. Thereby, one nation receives possibilities of survival and the other nation is deprived of them. 
now even the American Union is emerging in all fields as the sharpest competitor to all European nations fighting as export nations for the world's markets. The size and the wealth of her domestic market permits production figures and thereby production equipment which so reduce manufacturing costs that despite enormous wages it no longer seems possible to undercut her prices. Here the development of the automobile industry may be considered as a warning example. Not only because we Germans, for instance, despite our laughable wages, are not in a position, even only to a degree, to export successfully against American competition, but we must also look on as American cars spread alarmingly even to our own country. This is possible only because the size of her domestic market, her wealth in purchasing power, and also in raw materials, that guarantees the American automobile industry domestic sales figures which alone make possible manufacturing methods which in Europe would be impossible in consequence of the lack of these domestic sales potentials. Hitler goes on to say that there lies great danger in overcrowding a territory with more people than it can sustain were something to happen to the outside food provider. A special danger of the so-called peaceful economic policy, however, lies above all in the fact that it makes possible an increase in the population which finally no longer stands in any relation to the productive capacity of its own soil to support life. Thus overfilling of an inadequate living space with people that it cannot sustain. A healthy folk at least will always seek to find the satisfaction of its needs on its own soil. Any other condition is pathological and dangerous even if it makes possible the sustenance of a folk for centuries world trade, world economy, tourist traffic and so on and so forth are all transient means for securing a nation's sustenance. They are dependent upon factors which are partly beyond calculation and which on the other hand lie beyond a nation's power. At all times the surest foundation for the existence of a folk has been its own soil. What Hitler seems to mean here is that becoming dependent on food from an outside nation puts Germany in a tremendously weak power political position. Essentially, he seems to mean that if Germany establishes a dependence on another country for food, it will become easy for that country to starve Germany's population by simply stopping the shipments of food. Germany loses its independence, hence it puts Germany in a weak negotiation position. The country that has imported food is overpopulated. And now, in consequence of the loss of all the real basic requirements, they no longer have any possibility of being able to feed their overgrown mass of people adequately. They have no strength to break the chains of the enemy. If a nation has a balance between domestic production and demand in all fields, they make the subsistence of the people as a whole more or less independent of foreign countries, and thus help to secure the freedom of the state and the independence of the nation particularly in difficult periods. For one thing, the possibility of preserving a healthy peasant class as a foundation for a whole nation can never be valued highly enough. Many of our present day sufferings are only the consequence of the unhealthy relationship between rural and city population. Moreover, he also says that if a nation becomes an industrial export economy, that would lead then to a concentration of people in cities, which he deems undesirable. A solid stock of small and middle peasants has at all times been the best defense against social ills such as we possess today. This overfilling of an inadequate living space with people not seldom also leads to the concentration of people in work centers which look less like cultural centers and rather more like abscesses in the national body in which all evil, vices and diseases seem to unite. Above all, they are breeding grounds of blood mixing and bastardization and of race lowering, thus resulting in those purulent infection centers in which the international Jewish racial maggots thrive and finally affect further destruction. Lastly, Hitler's perhaps greatest argument against supplying Germany with food through import and paying for it with increased export money is that it would lead to England declaring war on Germany. During the decades before World War I and after Germany's unification in 1871, Germany's competing export economy had already put serious pressure on the British industry and export. Hitler explains it in the following way. Present day national Germany, which sees the fulfillment of the national task in its limited border policy, 
cannot deceive herself that the problem of the nation's sustenance will in any way be solved thereby. For even the utmost success of this policy of the restoration of the borders of 1914 would bring only a renewal of the economic situation of the year 1914. In other words, the question of sustenance, which then, as now, was completely unsolved, will imperiously force us onto the tracks of world economy and world export. As a matter of fact, the German bourgeoisie and the so-called national leagues with it also think only in economic political terms. Production, export and import are the catchwords with which they juggle and from which they hope for the nation's salvation in the future. It is hoped to raise the export capacity through an increase of production and thereby be able to provide adequately for import needs. Only it is completely forgotten that for Germany this whole problem as has already been stressed, is not at all a problem of increasing production, but rather a question of sales possibility. And that the export difficulties would not at all be eliminated by a reduction of German production costs, as again, our bourgeois sly dogs presume. Because inasmuch as this in itself is only partly possible in consequence of our limited domestic market, making German export commodities able to compete by lowering production costs, for instance, through the dismantling of our social legislation and the duties and burdens resulting therefrom, it will only bring us closer to where we had landed on August 4th, 1914. It really is part of the whole incredible bourgeois national naivete to presume that England would or ever could tolerate a German competition dangerous to her. Yet these are the very same people who well know and who always stress that Germany did not want a war in 1914 but that instead she was literally pushed into it and that it was England who, out of sheer competitive envy, gathered together former enemies and let loose against Germany. Today, however, these incurable economic dreamers imagine that England, after having risked the whole existence of her world empire in the monstrous four and one half year world war in which she remained the victor, will now view German competition differently than at that time. As if for England, this whole question were a sporting matter. No. For decades before the war, England had tried to break the threatening German economic competition, the growing German maritime trade and so on, with economic countermeasures. Only when they were forced to understand that this would not succeed, and when, on the contrary, Germany, by building her navy, showed that she was actually determined to carry out her economic warfare to the extent of the peaceful conquest of the world, did England, as a last resort, invoke violence? And now, after she has remained the victor, they think they can play the game all over again. Whereas on top of all this, Germany today is not at all in a position to throw any kind of power factor into the scales, thanks indeed to her domestic and foreign policy. The attempt to restore our folk's sustenance and to be able to maintain it by the increase of our production and by reducing the costs of the same ultimately will fail for the reason that we cannot undertake the final consequence of this struggle because of the lack of military power. Thus the end would be a collapse of the German folk's sustenance and of all these hopes along with it. But even if Germany were to master all her increasing economic difficulties, she would still be in the same spot as she had already been on August 4th, 1914. The ultimate decision as to the outcome of the struggle for the world market will lie in power and not in economics. Now, the original problem was a lack of available food to feed a growing German population, with the three alternatives of 1. Increasing productivity of the soil, 2. Internal colonization, and 3. Importing food, all deemed by Hitler as unrealistic solutions, then population increase appears out of reach for Germany, as Hitler wrote himself. From an examination of all factors, especially in view of the limitation of our own raw materials, and the ensuing threatening dependence on other countries, Germany's future perforce appears very gloomy and sad. So in a situation when the demand for food increases because of a growing population, while on the other hand the supply and amount of food cannot increase because of the above mentioned reasons, then what happens? While Hitler never exactly explains how he reasoned here, the following seems to be how he got to his conclusions of birth control and emigration. Well, as a simple matter of supply and demand, if the supply of a product such as a food is stable, but the demand increases with time, 
then the price will go up. It will keep going up as long as the population and demand keeps going up. The food will never run out in such a situation, but rather at some point the food cost will get prohibitively expensive. We have to remember that a family has many different needs and wants. Having children is just one of them among several like food, housing, education, healthcare, leisure and more. The essence of economics is to make choices about allocating limited resources to satisfy different unlimited needs and wants. And to think that a family is willing to sacrifice their entire living standard just to have another child is not realistic. In the family's private economy, the overall living standard on the one side would have to be weighed against more food and more children on the other side. If the cost of raising additional children significantly impacts the overall living standard, they may try to solve the situation themselves and decide to have fewer children. Hitler seems to acknowledge this likely situation here. Through their own measures they try to bring about a rectification as they understand it and as it arises from their own insight. The fight against having the child begins. They want to lead a life like others and cannot. What is more natural than that, the responsibility is put on large families in which no joy is taken anymore and which are limited as much as possible as a burdensome evil. When food has become too expensive, the family prioritizes keeping their living standard rather than having another baby. And when having another baby is deemed undesirable and out of the question, the solution that people then resort to is not to stop having sex, but rather to 1. use birth control, or 2. to emigrate. They would use birth control to avoid increasing the number of family members, or they would emigrate to get the family out of Germany into other countries where the economic and food conditions are better. Just as he writes. Then, instead of fighting for daily bread, the nation rather will cut down on this bread and, what is even more probable, limit the number of people either through peaceful emigration or through birth control in order in this way to escape an enormous distress. Emigration and birth control are the medicines recommended for our nation's salvation by the representatives of pacifistic economic policy and the Marxist view of the state. This reduction of the population was sometimes effected through hunger, sometimes through emigration, and at times through endless unfortunate wars. In recent times, it has been effected by voluntary birth control. But why does Hitler hate birth control, and why does he hate emigration? What is his logical reason against them? Starting with birth control, he is against it not only because it limits the population, but also because with birth control the strongest child does not even get a chance to compete for life. So instead of letting as many children as possible get a chance to be born, and then in tough times prioritizing the healthiest of the children to survive, we limit ourselves to one or two children and let them survive at any cost regardless of how deserving of life they are. Even here the loss in numbers is not decisive, but the terrible fact that through birth control the highest potential values of a folk are destroyed at the very outset, for then he himself immediately embarks upon a road opposite to that taken by nature. Whereas nature, out of the multitude of beings who are born, spares the few who are most fitted in terms of health and resistance to wage life struggle, man limits the number of births and then tries to keep alive those who have been born with no regard to their real value or to their inner worth. Here his humanity is only the handmaiden of his weakness, and at the same time it is actually the cruelest destroyer of his existence. If man wants to limit the number of births on his own without producing the terrible consequences which arise from birth control, he must give the number of births free reign but cut down on the number of those remaining alive. At one time the Spartans were capable of such a wise measure, but not our present mendaciously sentimental bourgeois patriotic nonsense, but this was the result of a systematic race preservation. Thus Sparta must be regarded as the first folkish state. The exposure of sick, weak, deformed children, in short their destruction, was more decent and in truth a thousand times more humane than the wretched insanity of our day which preserves the most pathological subject, and indeed at any price, and yet takes the life of a hundred thousand healthy children in consequence of birth control or through abortions, in order subsequently to breed a race of degenerates burdened with illnesses, by exposing them to hard trials and deprivations, 
with the result that all those who are less strong and less healthy are forced back into the womb of the eternal unknown. Those whom she permits to survive the inclemency of existence are a thousandfold tested, hardened, and well adapted to procreate in turn in order that the process of thoroughgoing selection may begin again from the beginning. By thus brutally proceeding against the individual and immediately calling him back to herself as soon as he shows himself unequal to the storm of life, she keeps the race and species strong, in fact, raises them to the highest accomplishments. It is different, however, when man undertakes the limitation of his number. He is not carved of the same wood. He is humane. He knows better than the cruel queen of wisdom. He limits not the conservation of the individual, but procreation itself. This seems to him who always sees himself and never the race more human and more justified than the opposite way. Unfortunately, however, the consequences are the reverse. While nature, by making procreation free, yet submitting survival to a hard trial, chooses from an excess number of individuals the best as worthy of living, thus preserving them alone and in them conserving their species, man limits procreation but is hysterically concerned that once a being is born, it should be preserved at any price. This correction of the divine will seems to him as wise as it is humane, and he takes delight in having once again gotten the best of nature and even having proved her inadequacy. The number, to be sure, has really been limited, but at the same time, the value of the individual has diminished. This, however, is something the dear little ape of the Almighty does not want to see or hear about. For as soon as procreation as such is limited and the number of births diminished, the natural struggle for existence, which leaves only the strongest and healthiest alive, is obviously replaced by the obvious desire to save even the weakest and most sickly at any price. And this plants the seed of a future generation which must inevitably grow more and more deplorable the longer this mockery of nature and her will continues. And the end will be that such a people will someday be deprived of its existence on this earth. For man can defy the eternal laws of the will to conservation for a certain time. But sooner or later, vengeance comes. A stronger race will drive out the weak, for the vital urge in its ultimate form will, time and again, burst all the absurd fetters of the so-called humanity of individuals in order to replace it by the humanity of nature which destroys the weak to give his place to the strong. Therefore, anyone who wants to secure the existence of the German people by a self-limitation of its reproduction is robbing it of its future. I have already set forth the consequences of the fight against the child. They lie in a reduction of the count of individuals brought to life so that a further selection cannot take place. On the contrary, people take pains that all who are once born are kept alive under any circumstances. Since, however, ability, energy and so on are not necessarily connected with the firstborn, but instead become visible in each case only in the course of the struggle for existence, the possibility of a weeding out and a selection according to such criteria is removed. Nations become impoverished in talents and energies. But if man himself prevents the procreation of a greater number of children and limits himself to the firstborn, or at least to the secondborn, then he will nevertheless want to preserve especially these inferior racial elements of the nation, even if these do not possess the most valuable characteristics. Thus, he artificially hinders nature's process of selection. He prevents it and thereby helps to impoverish a nation of powerful personalities. He destroys the peak value of a folk. Besides this, Hitler means that what makes matters with birth control even worse is that it's usually the most intelligent and valuable people to a society that are the most likely to use it. Through birth control in the homeland, it is likewise those who, in consequence of their racial value, that have worked themselves up to the higher levels of life and society, who are at first affected. Whether they are of higher racial value is something else, but historical and sociological data does support the notion that wealthier and more highly educated individuals often have fewer children due to career priorities and access to birth control. 
Okay, that's why he abandons birth control as an option, but what about emigration? He writes the following. As a matter of fact, the New Reich never knew how to banish this need for food. Even in the New Reich at first, an attempt was made to keep the relation between population and land within tolerable limits through a permanent emigration. For the most shattering proof of the soundness of our assertion of the towering importance of the relation between population and land lies in the fact that in consequence of this disproportion, specifically in Germany during the 1870s, 1880s and 1890s, the distress led to an epidemic of emigration which even at the beginning of the 1890s had swollen to a figure of nearly one and a quarter million people a year. Now, one might ask Hitler, what is wrong with the German population emigrating out of Germany into other countries? By moving Germans onto other lands where there is more food and resources, it would seem that emigration might actually be something that would allow the German population to keep growing. Is it not so? Here is why Hitler writes as an answer to that. Since the German folk does not consist of Jews, the German element, especially in Anglo-Saxon countries, nevertheless and unfortunately will increasingly be anglicized and presumably likewise be lost to our folk, spiritually and ideologically as well, just as its practical work accomplishments are already lost to them. He means that the Jews, compared to other peoples, such as the Germans, have a stronger national identity, and that's why the Jews can manage to live inside other nations without getting absorbed and losing and forgetting their original identity. He means that this would not work for Germans. He also means that those Germans emigrating to other countries would not be Germans for long. That they would be given as a free gift to the host nation and blend in with the passage of time. If we today, 2024, exactly 100 years later, look at the German element in the United States, this is actually what largely has happened. Of the Germans not united with the motherland, in consequence of the slow loss of dedicated racial comrades, millions of Germans find themselves in a situation which, in all human probability, will one day cause their de-Germanization. In no case, however, will they be able to take further part in the motherland's fateful struggle in any kind of decisive form, and just as little, too, in the cultural development of their folk. Whatever the German element individually accomplishes in North America, it will not be reckoned to the benefit of the German folk as such, but adds to the cultural aggregate of the American Union. Here the Germans are really only the cultural fertilizers for other folks. Indeed, in reality, the greatness of these nations is in general not seldom to be ascribed to the high percentage of German contributions and accomplishments. It is sad to know that our whole national political wisdom, insofar as it does not see any advantage at all in emigration, is at most saddened by the weakening of the number of its own people, or at best speaks of a cultural fertilizer which is thereby given to other states. As a side note to this first point, Hitler also means that the loss of Germans abroad can be reduced and mitigated if Germany in the motherland transmits a good impression abroad. Which goes back to my earlier point. The Germans in the United States have as a result of Germany losing World War II and the subsequent shame etc. distant themselves even more from the German nationality. If, notwithstanding, the German element abroad wants to remain true to the nation, this can at the outset be only a question of a language and cultural loyalty in that the more it rises to a consciously manifested feeling of belongingness, the more does the motherland of the German nation honor the German name in the dignity of her representatives. Thus the more Germany as a Reich transmits a mark of the greatness of the German folk to the world, the more will the German element conclusively lost to the state receive a stimulus at least to take pride in belonging spiritually to this folk. On the other hand, the more wretchedly the motherland herself attends to her interests and accordingly transmits a bad impression abroad, the weaker will the inner inducement be felt to belong to such a folk. Secondly, Hitler's perhaps greatest anger about emigration stems from his reasoning that emigration steals the strongest and best people from Germany and that by doing so, it's making the German people weaker and weaker. Through emigration, a folk is slowly robbed of its best blood in hundreds of thousands of individual life catastrophes. What is not perceived is the worst. Since the emigration does not proceed according to territory, nor according to age categories, but instead remains subject to the free rule of fate, 
It always drains away from a folk, the most courageous and the boldest people, the most determined and most prepared for resistance. The peasant youth who emigrated to America 150 years ago was as much the most determined and most adventurous man in his village as the worker who today goes to Argentina. The coward and weakling would rather die at home than pluck up the courage to earn his bread in an unknown foreign land, regardless whether it is distress, misery, political pressure, or religious compulsion that weighs on people, it will always be those who are the healthiest and the most capable of resistance who will be able to put up the most resistance. The weakling will always be the first to subject himself. His preservation is generally as little a gain for the victor as the stay-at-homes are for the mother country. Not seldom, therefore, the law of action is passed on from the mother country to the colonies, because there a concentration of the highest human values has taken place in a wholly natural way. However, the positive gain for the new country is thus a loss for the mother country. As soon as a folk once loses its best, strongest and most natural forces through emigration in the course of centuries, it will hardly be able any more to muster the inner strength to put up the necessary resistance to fate in critical times. Human birth control wipes out the bearer of the highest values and emigration destroys the value of the average. So there you have it, a summary as complete as possible of why and how Hitler thought that the lack of living space in Germany was a problem and also the end of this first part of the two part video series. Now you know what the problem for Germany was after World War I and why increasing the productivity of the soil, that is internal colonization, birth control or emigration were not seen by Hitler as realistic solutions. As I explained in the introduction, the second part will deal with what Hitler thought the solution should be to the lack of living space. That is, the might of a victorious sword and the sword as the pathbreaker for the plow. The might of a victorious sword and the sword as the pathbreaker for the plow.